Hi, and welcome to Chapter 3. In Chapter 3, we are going to be covering fiber optic cable, so Fios. Um, let's get started. As I like to do in every lesson, I'm going to show you where we are in our roadmap. So we have covered our copper. Now we're going to do our fiber optic. We're going to be about halfway through our media descriptions. With fiber optic cable, there's a lot of characteristics that we need to be aware of. Um, first off, fiber optic cable is generally either a glass or a plastic core that carries a pulse of light as opposed to a copper core that carries pulses of electricity. Each pulse of light represents your binary data, so on or off. So if the light is there, it's on. If the light is off, it's off. On or off, multiple pulses, and they're going to be able to tell you where your data is. To run fiber optic cable, you have to have both a transmitter and a receiver. So your transmitter is going to convert your electrical data into light pulses, run it through the fiber optic cable, and then the receiver on the other end is going to convert those light pulses back into your binary data so it can be used by the computer on the other end. In the example here, you can see how we have our source and our destination, um, both of which are necessary, obviously, for transmission of data. The example here of the picture is similar to what fiber optic cable actually looks like if it were zoomed in. This is a very zoomed in picture of fiber optic. And we're gonna go through some different pictures of fiber optic as we go through this lesson to show you what it looks like. You may not have the opportunity to hold fiber optic in your hand. So I wanna give you as much examples of this as possible to show you what fiber optic looks like. I recommend also going onto the internet and looking for images of fiber optic just so you can get a visual in your head. Reasons why you would use fiber optic. So one of the big reasons for fiber optic is security. If you were to put a cut in the fiber optic line to put in a wiretap or something like that, um, it would be obvious. It would be very easily if, um, recognizable in your data. So things like wiretaps just can't happen with fiber optic the way that they do with regular copper. That doesn't mean that they can't happen entirely. It's just that they're much easier to detect. Big thing about fiber optic is it's immune to electromagnetic interference. So remember with our fiber optic or with our coax and our copper cables, we had the problem of electromagnetic interference. If you had a microwave, if you had fluorescent lights, they were gonna affect your cabling. Fiber optic doesn't get affected that way. So we can run it without having to worry about electromagnetic interference. Obviously it's smaller in diameter, but it also has a larger bandwidth because light can be transmitted um, at higher frequencies using than regular electrical signals. So you can have a higher bandwidth. Um, for the situation of having cables run under the ocean, fiber optic is um, resistant entirely to water and corrosion where um, copper is a problem. So we, we like that idea for underwater cables or even just running underground. We know that the cables are much more resistant to corrosion. The other thing with fiber is that we can run it at longer distances for each segment. A copper core is limited to that 100 meters, whereas fiber can go up to two or 3,000 meters, um, depending on which type of fiber that you use. So lots of different reasons why you would wanna pick fiber optic over your regular copper core. To understand how fiber optic works, you need to kind of understand how light works. So you've probably seen this image before of the spectrum of visible light. So we have our violets at one end and our reds at the other, going violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And this is our regular visible spectrum of light. So we call it um, the visible light spectrum, and it runs between about 390 nanometers and 770 nanometers. That's your regular visible light. On the lower end, you have your ultraviolet light. So that's the one you get your sunburns from. X-rays are also down there as well. And then going up the spectrum, we end up with our infrared and then a couple of other levels up that direction. This is where we're gonna be running our frequency for our light pulses going through our fiber optic. Generally, fiber optic is going to be run um, between 850 and 1500 nanometers. And we're gonna talk about which frequency it runs at as we move along. But understanding the difference, it's not in a visible spectrum. Um, it's just past it up in that infrared side but um, it is still run just like light is, so recognizing how light works. 
when you're looking at the electromagnetic wave, that is the energy that behaves like a wave, like we've talked about, and can only travel in a vacuum. So when we put this inside of our fiber optic cabling, it allows that, um, that light wave to run through the cabling and get to the other side. So this is a picture of an actual fiber optic cable, a singular fiber optic cable, um, and the way that it is constructed. There is also the cartoonish graphic of what it looks like so that you can see the different parts of it. Fiber optic is always built in four separate parts and they are nested inside of each other. So in the middle, in the very, very center of it, we have that glass or plastic core. Most fiber optic these days are gonna be glass. Um, that core is gonna be made of glass and it's going to allow the light to travel through the glass. However, we can't just have a clear piece of glass running here. So the next level is what we call the cladding, C-L-A-D-D, -D, cladding. And the cladding is there to block the light from escaping. We don't want the light to go through the glass and out. We, so we put this cladding there to separate that. You can also have a coating on top of the cladding to also add a waterproof protection. After the cladding, we have a couple of strengthening fibers that we call a buffer. So these are the fibers that you can see there, and um, they're very, very thin, and they just add a physical protection to both your cladding and your core to keep that glass from breaking, which is great. And then on the outside, we have what are what's called our sheath, or our um, the in this case, the orange section, that's kind of like the insulating jacket that we had in our copper core. In this case, it's an insulating jacket um, that is both water and oil resistant so that when it gets wet or if it has oil on it or if anything else touches it, that's going to be our protective insulating jacket. When you build your fiber optic, you aren't going to be building them, but if you were to be building fiber optic, you have the option of having your sheath filled with a gel, which we call a loose tube that allows the core to kind of freely move around. Makes it much easier to work with if you're working long distances because you're not as worried about that core breaking. If we do want um, a smaller diameter, we can do a tight buffer, which is going to be um, the sheath bound tightly to the core. It's not going to be as movable or, or malleable, um, and so it's going to be more prone to breaking over long distances, but it does work as well. When we have our fiber optic, it is run by the National Electric Code, so they essentially have their jurisdiction over the standards of how fiber is built, how fiber is designed. A couple of characteristics that go with our fiber optic. You've heard the word attenuation, and we're going to repeat it about six more times before the course is over, I promise. Attenuation is the loss of signal. So even with light, we are going to have some loss of signal over distances. So attenuation is going to be a problem. The, the chart here that describes how much power lost is lost with each decibel um, of attenuation. So we really want to keep that attenuation to a minimum for obvious reasons. If we have three decibels of attenuation, we've already lost 50% of our power. So we need to be really, really careful about that. When we have our fiber optic core, we're going to have concepts called um, scattering and dispersion. So scattering is where you have impurities in the core. So nothing is, is in a pure vacuum. We're not going to make these perfect. And you're going to have some little impurities in there. So just little pieces um, of, of items inside of there, whether they're dust or um, just some impurities of some type that end up in the core, um, some degeneration of the core, things like that, that can cause um, the light signal to be scattered. If you run the light against one of these impurities, it's going to have the option of splitting the way that it does when light hits a um, prism. So if you had your light hit one of these impurities, it's going to cause what we call scattering and the light's going to get scattered. That's going to cause some of your attenuation, some of your loss of signal. We also have dispersion, which is just distortion of the light waves just as they reflect, because they're going to be hitting that cladding, that outside cladding, um, outside of your glass. And just the reflection from those light waves as they bump into the cladding is also going to cause some distortion. So it causes, um, when you have your distortion, 
your light reaches the end at different times. The same way, again, if you had running through a, a, a prism, if you bump into something, the light doesn't always it, hit the exact same spots. So we do have dispersion problems. Um, extrinsic loss, losses are where we have actually affected the cabling. We have caused splices or connectors or bends that are going to cause um, some problems with your light as well. This is actually the most significant reason for signal losses in your fiber optic cable. So we, we do a pretty good job of making sure that you don't have that many impurities and that the dispersion from hitting the clouding isn't too terrible, but you are gonna have some extrinsic losses simply from the places where you had to connect it. So you had to cut your cable, you had to put two ends together, you had to put a connector in there. These can cause some extrinsic losses. We have a reflection loss that we call a Fresnel reflection loss. And this is going to happen because of refraction differences in the core, the connection, or even just air. Just the air going through the spacing can cause this reflection loss. This usually happens at connection points. So again, you've cut your cable, you put a connector together, and in that space where the connector is, you can have the interdiction of light, of I mean of air, um, or other differences in the core at that point, going from one core to another. And last, we talk about absorption. This is when materials actually absorb some of the light. You've seen light where if you put it at certain angles, um, some of the light doesn't get reflected. It isn't ever 100%. Some of it just gets absorbed by the material. It happens as well in fiber optic. So these are different things that can occur to your fiber optic as it's being run inside the cabling to cause problems with attenuation or that loss of signal. When you're looking at your cable, we have two different types of fiber optic cable that we work with. The first is called single mode and the second is called multi-mode. So single mode is smaller in diameter. It's going to be the image on the top here where it's a very, very small diameter, usually about nine micron uh, micrometers. So um, nine micrometers. And then you have your cladding and then you have 125 micrometers for your entire um, core or for your entire cable. So you can see the core going through the middle is really, really, really small. Um, and we call this single mode. Single mode cabling is very small in its diameter and it's designed to actually match the diameter of the actual light wave. It almost runs like a laser just goes straight through and it doesn't do as much bouncing, which means you don't have as much dispersion or other issues and it causes the light to actually go further. The other option that we have is called multi-mode and in multi-mode it has a larger diameter that can cause more problems with dispersion because of the spacing. So in this case, instead of having nine, nine micrometers, we have 62.5 micrometers for that core area. In this case, we can actually have multiple frequencies going through um, and being able to have um, multiple paths of light going through. With our multi-mode, we have two different ways of designing it. We have what we call a step index or a graded index. So our step index is just the general multi-mode without any extra things with it. If someone says it's multi-mode and doesn't give you any extra words, it's gonna be your regular step index and that's gonna be normal. Your graded index actually has varying grades of core material. So they're either thicker or thinner in different areas. This helps it to reduce that tendency to disperse because instead of hitting the same area every time, it's going to cause more of a curve of your light waves instead of bumping and causing a, um, a hard angle. It causes more curving, so it doesn't cause as much dispersion. When we refer to our cables, we refer to them by their size. So in this case, our um, single mode would be um, a nine micrometer for its core and our um, outside diameter is gonna be 1 125. Whereas with our multi-mode, it's gonna be 62.5 and then 125. So again, our outside diameter looks the same. Our inside diameter is dependent on whether it's single mode or multi-mode. And we'll see that in just a second with the chart of different types of cabling. So this is a chart from your book. I recommend actually getting this because it probably looks easy, better on your book than it does through the video. Um, these are your different IE 802.3 standards for fiber optic cabling. So there, you can see that they follow the same kind of pattern that we did with our, with our copper, where we have our um, 10 base 
and then fiber, um, and then single mode or multi mode. And then we have either a short range, long range, or extended range, or a short wavelength, long wavelength, or extended wavelength. You can see here all of the multi modes are going to have that 62.5 diameter, um, or they can also have a 50 diameter. So these are your options that you have with the multi mode. Whereas with a single mode, it's always at nine. So when you're doing this chart, you can recognize single modes are going to be at nine. Multi modes are going to be have a core diameter at that 62.5. The wavelengths are going to change a little bit based on which type of cabling you have. So with our gigabit Ethernet here, um, this is going to be our right our, our 1000 base and then SX or LX. This is going to be a short or long depending on um, how far they can go in cable in meters. So our gigabit ethernet, um, either 300 or 550. Then we can get into our 10 gig ethernet, which can go a little further. So you can see that our 10 gig um, ethernet for our long range can actually get up to 10 kilometers and our extended range can get up to 40 kilometers. So it's important to recognize what type of cabling you have and be able to kind of follow those numbers and make sure that you understand all the different aspects. So if I'm looking at a 10G, 10 gigabit base, so base um, band instead of broadband, so base, and then an LW. LW is going to be a long wavelength. In this case, our LW is a single mode and it has a diameter of nine. Its wavelength is gonna use that 1310. And you can kind of look through the chart and you can see that that 1310 and that 850 kind of repeat themselves. Remember how I said fiber optic runs between 850 and 1550? That's, these are the different wavelengths that we can run them at. Um, their distances are different based on which type of cabling you're using. So if you're using a long range or a long wavelength or an extended range, you can get up to that 40 kilometers. Um, our fiber optic is generally run in a, um, a ring topology using a concept called fiber distributed data interface or FDDI, um, 2Ds. So the standard for the fiber backbones um, can be over long distances and high speeds. So it's important for you to recognize those distances and speeds. 200 kilometers um, or 120 miles is a pretty long distance that we can run for our fiber backbones. Remember our backbones. We like to use the dual ring topology concept because it really guarantees that continuous communication even if something happens. The examples over on the right hand side are going to show you what happens if there is a break in the primary ring, then it can still run through the secondary ring. If there is a break in both the primary and the secondary rings, you can see that we can just use that fourth node and just go back for the secondary ring. Um, and then the node three flip there as well, essentially when there's a break between three and four. Because of the way that FDDI is designed with this dual ring topology, you can be really guaranteed that you're always going to have that continuous communication. When we talk about our media using FDDI, um, again, you can have either single or double or a multi-mode. We talked about our core diameter. Our wavelength in both of them is usually about 1300 nanometers, but our distances are different. If we're using single mode, we can get distances up to that 40,000 or 40, um, yeah, 40,000 meters. Yeah, 40 kilometers, um, excuse me, 40 kilometers. Or if we're doing multi-mode, we can do 2000 kilometers. So these are kind of our distances that we wanna keep straight as to how we can run this. But the FDDI interface is how we run our fiber. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to play with fiber optic cables in your lab for this um, unless you choose to come into the um, into the lab at the school. So I'm not expecting you to go get your own fiber optic connectors, but I do want you to be able to see them. And part of your um, your assignments in the course are going to be to be able to recognize the different shapes of the connectors and how they're used. So in this case, we talk about the form factor which is the shape of the connectors. So we have our ST connector, which is a round connector that goes in and then twists to lock into place. Whereas an SC connector, they go together and they have a little clip that holds them in place as opposed to twisting. We also have an FC connector, which is kind of a, a longer tube. 
and the LC. So the LC connector we can actually create into a duplex. So most of our connectors, the, the first four, are all single or simplex con connectors. They're just a single unit. But we have the option of making duplex units. This is kind of nice if you want to have two cables, one running one direction, one running the other, and you want to have the cable connectors connecting them both. So in this case, we can create a duplex out of our LC connector and make it into an LC duplex. And you can see that way it has two cables. And we can also use our MJRT, which is always a duplex. So MJRT is always a duplex. It's designed that way. And our LC, we can make into a duplex. Otherwise, the other ones are single or simplex. So just a single as opposed to two. These are different types of connectors. And I really do recommend that you take a few minutes, go onto the internet and just look at the different connectors, kind of see them in a real world example and feel how they would work, um, just to help you to understand them a little bit better. When you are installing fiber optic, as I've said, it's very important that you install it correctly. It's not as easy to do as your Cat5 um, or your coax or even your, um, your copper core. With fiber optic cable installations, they have to be done perfectly. There can be no chips or cuts that are that are diagonal. Um, you have to make sure that they work together. And then when you're putting them back together for your connectors, you can fuse them using what we call a fusion splice to um, actually use heat to fuse and melt the materials back together again. If you're going to be um, making fiber optic cables, you need to use um, what we call a cleaver which is going to cut perfectly in a straight line. If you do it incorrectly, you can make your cuts um, edged wrong um, if it's not a square cut, which can cause problems again with that attenuation, things not getting to the right place. When we talked about reasons why the, the light may not get where it's supposed to go, a lot of times it can be because the cables were not connected correctly. So a fusion splice is where we join the fiber together with heat and fuse it together. When we've created our cabling and we want to check it, if it is a short distance, we can use a light meter and a light source. So we would put like a flashlight on one end and you can have a light meter on the other end. And if you get enough of the light coming back, then you'll know that you're good and there's no problems. However, obviously with longer distances, that's not going to cut it. You're not going to be able to run a light straight through um, and be able to, you probably could for, for some distance, but not for a long distance. So for those, we use what we call an optical time domain reflectometer. Yeah, very confusing. OTDR. And an OTDR is actually designed to hook to both ends of the cabling and then test it. So it will run the light through and then it'll use computers to analyze the light that's coming back and actually be able to tell you if there are problems in your cabling. When they are running actual fiber optic, they want to make sure that that cabling is perfectly straight um, or that it's, it's perfectly aligned and that the light going in on one side, you get as much of it as you can from the other side. So we use this OTDR to um, determine how much of the light we're getting back on the other side. So these are different things that you would use while installing your fiber optic. When we look over to the right hand side, we can see different reasons why fiber optic may not be working very well. So when we do a proper slice, you can see everything lines up beautifully and it just is perfectly straight and it looks nice. If you have a non-square cut, but the other end of the cabling is square cut, it's not gonna connect correctly. If your two cables are not aligned correctly, you'll have a misalignment, that doesn't work either. If they're not polished smooth, so you have to make sure when you finish cutting that you've polished the ends of the fiber optic smooth so that they can connect nicely. If there's any rough jagged edges, those also will not connect nicely. If you've left a gap, gaps are bad. Gaps let in air and impurities and those can cause problems as we've said. And then of course, if you have one diameter, say you have a single mode and you try to connect it to a multi-mode, your diameters are not gonna match. If your diameters don't match, nothing's gonna work right. So these are different reasons you can have problems with your fiber optic installation. Thanks for listening to this lecture on fiber optic cable. You'll find the assignments in D2L or in, um, in back of the chapter. I recommend highly that you do go through the labs and that you do the study guide questions just because they're going to help you to really understand. A lot of these questions are going to be on the Network Plus exam and you really want to make sure you understand the different aspects of fiber optic cable. Come back next time and we'll start talking about wireless. Thanks for watching.